welcome. Welcome everyone to our panel today um, and our project, which you see here on our um, beautiful slide, a uh, project called, we're calling Global Family Systems and Psychosocial Resilience. Um, this is a project funded by a special uh, grant within the U.S. State Department and um, in partnership with a couple of other organizations, including Partners of the Americas and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, which also administers the Fulbright. Um, the goal of our project is we are hoping to work throughout uh, 2021, early sp uh, spring of next year, with various systemic family-focused mental health and psychosocial support communities to develop and distribute open access, that is free at no cost, guest expert panels that focus on global family systems approaches and psychosocial resilience during the COVID-19, during the pandemic. So we're pandemic specific and family systems specific. And we're um, so, so grateful that you are here visiting us from all your different parts uh, on the globe. So we are recording this um, session and it will be uploaded uh, probably within a couple of weeks to our website. So I will start by introducing our first panelist, um, Dr. Adelina Ameti. Uh, Pronai, who is a child psychiatrist who works at the University Clinical Center in Pristina in Kosovo. She's an assistant at assistant psychiatrist at, at the University Clinical Center of Pristina, Department of Neuropsychiatry. She's provided supervision to SOS Kinderdorf educators and been a lecturer at Dardania College um, in the Masters in Family Counseling program. She has worked uh, with Kosovo Systemic Family Therapy Training Programs that was implemented by KHF, Kosovo Health Foundation, and trained by multiple international family therapy trainers. She has a certificate in DIR floor time, uh, very interesting work, and she's also working on uh, further studies as a doctoral candidate at Sister Cyril and Methodius University Faculty of Medicine in Skopje. So welcome, welcome, Adelina. Camila, I hand it over, or pardon me, Said or Camila, I'm not sure who's next. <laughs> me. Uh, okay, Dr. Mimosa Shahini was educated in Cambridge, uh, Trinam, and Vienna. She's a medical doctor specialized in adult psychiatry with a sub-specialty in child and adolescent psychiatry and family therapy. She's a lecturer at the University of um, Prigita, uh, Pristina and at several private universities in the region. Dr. Shahini is an expert in combat-related disorders and has published several papers on the subject. She works as um, a lecturer and consultant for the World Psychiatric Association, WPA, NATO, and other international organizations. But first and foremost, she's an expert by experience, having um, contributed to the care of refugee children after Kosovo War between 1995 and 1998. Uh, Dr. Shahini holds a treasure of knowledge and experience and perhaps some important lessons to learn for um, European child psychiatrists who are facing the same challenges now. Uh, dealing with mental health issues of the current entrance of uh, refugee families in Europe. Welcome, Dr. Mimosa Shahini. Um, it's my I'm pleasure to, to yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Said. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Liri Lokai. Uh, she's a psychologist by profession. She completed her bachelor's studies in psychology and her master's studies in clinical psychology and health at the University of Pristina. Currently, she is a PhD candidate in the field of education provided by the Faculty of Education, University of Pristina. Liri finished the five years training program on systemic family therapy training. Uh, Liri is also certified as an online counselor by the UK-based Institute for Online Therapy and is licensed 
as a clinical psychologist by the Ministry of Health of Kosovo. In addition, Liri has attended many other trainings in the field of mental health. For more than 12 years, Liri has worked in various local and international organizations in projects that contribute to the field of education and social welfare and well being. Since 2013, she has offered psychotherapy in a private ambulance for clinical psychology, UNI. She is also co founder of this institution. I am pleased to uh, welcome uh, Liri uh, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you. So we pass it on to our lovely panelists um, and let you. Um, Take us, uh, take us to your work. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, uh, Lori, you're muted, so maybe we shall uh, start. Yes, when I'm muting, okay. that means go for it. <laughs> thank okay, you. Thank you. So we had a short discussion among all three of us, and uh, uh, we decided that since since I'm the youngest one, I will start. Uh, I will be the first panelist, and then Adelina and Mimosa uh, for the end. Um, since I'm the first one, I will maybe just um, very briefly uh, share a few points regarding the context of Kosovo. So. As you know, Kosovo has gone through a very um, difficult war, I must say, 20 years ago. So uh, the pandemic situation, I think, has affected even more strongly, in a negative sense, the community of Kosovo. Because the trauma is, uh, is already here. I mean, it's 20 years, it's not a very long time. And most of the people remember very clearly that period. So in a way, this... Um, is correlated with our uh, sense of survivor, uh, of surviving. And it was a very uh, small situation in the beginning of pandemic when there was a lack of uh, flour to, to be bought in the, in the market just for a few days. And people uh, reacted uh, very strongly towards that in a way that triggered uh, very negative reactions and panic among people. And this was just for a few days. And, all the media and the government was stating that there is enough uh, flour for everyone, it will come, and, but still uh, people felt very insecure. And I think this, uh, this showed uh, a lot about um, our past and uh, the way uh, we feel when we, uh, when we, uh, when we are in, in a dangerous situation, let's say. So maybe in a way this has impacted even more strongly the community of Kosovo. In other ways, um, mental health here uh, is not uh, among uh, the first priorities of the government, as it is actually in many other countries, as far as I, I could see. So all the, the policies that have been drafted so far are usually uh, uh, targeting uh, the economy and uh, the general health due to the pandemic, but mental health is not, um, it's not a priority so far. So there, there is no uh, concrete strategy on how uh, the country is going to take care of, of the people who will be impacted, uh, let's say, in, in their mental health through the situation. Because as we know, um, there have been many studies uh, conducted in the world and a few uh, small scale studies in Kosovo as well. And they all showed and confirmed that uh, parents um, uh, are feeling insecure and afraid uh, about their children's future and as well about their well-being. Um, and we know that um, as well the economical situation is uh, it's not very good these days and uh, this always impacts the family dynamics when the family has financial difficulties. Usually that contributes negatively to the uh, family uh, homeostasis, let's say. Um, just one example, there was the, uh, recently a study published in, uh, in Italy uh, that found that more than half of people who received uh, uh, hospital treatment for COVID-19 were found to be suffering from a psychiatric disorder a month after. 
so a month after the uh, hospitalization period. And uh, their, the most diagnoses were PTSD, depression, anxiety. These three were the main, and as well insomnia and OCDs and so on. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure that if we replicate this study in Kosovo, we would have similar data or maybe even um, higher numbers reported uh, by people who were hospitalized because generally the condition um, uh, in, in the hospitals are okay, but still there is a, a lot of room for improvement, let's say, when it comes to services, uh, because um, uh, the state was not prepared definitely for uh, this big, uh, let's say, number of patients that we, we have so far hospitalized. Um, and another very big issue which came out uh, to be uh, as a result of the pandemic was the increased level of dom domestic violence. And this has been reported actually in other countries as well. But here we, uh, we have uh, cases every day, new cases of uh, domestic violence, especially in the time of isolation. Um, in other countries, there have been reported as well a, a higher rate of divorce. We don't have yet uh, figures about this, but I think we can get this data after this period is finished. But um, it is uh, impacting uh, uh, the fam family dynamic in many negative ways, let's say. Um, based on my personal experience during this uh, last month, and most of it was online uh, usually, with individuals and families, um, which were not a lot actually, but generally uh, clients reported a higher level of distress due to pandemic. I mean, uh, this, uh, the pandemic situation is always mentioned during uh, sessions, even when the presenting problem is completely something different. So the situation has affected every individual and every family in some way or in some other way. Um, but definitely it is, um, it is not possible to, to escape from this. Uh, another big issue here is as well the, uh, the process of, uh, of school for students. So this process has been stopped and there was e-learning process uh, established from March, which, which has many difficulties, of course. And a few studies has, have been made in this regard. And the, showed that most of the parents really did not feel good having the role of a teacher because parents had to act as a teacher and serve as model and help their uh, child stay active and uh, stay socially connected. So uh, this was another issue added to all this process. Uh, the, the process of education, I mean, uh, it caused a lot of uh, difficulties for the families because most of the, of the parents didn't feel enough qualified, let's say, to support their children uh, in this process, because most of the work had to be done from, uh, from house and there were online lessons and everything, but not everyone could uh, have access um, to, to these services, which were not, of course, very comprehensive anyways. Um, but um, generally what we would need to do in this situation, I mean, our country and maybe other countries as well in terms of mental health, uh, it, uh, maybe the first thing we need to do is to design a few uh, intervening programs for families and communities and uh, see, I mean, to react immediately and see how to support community to uh, recover from all this, um, all, all this uh, traumatic period. And another way could be to organize more TV debates uh, in, on the importance of mental health awareness. Uh, this is this is being done to a certain level, but uh, of course there there is a lot of room for improvement, and the government would need to allocate more money um, in the field of mental health so that these uh, programs could be designed and implemented afterwards. Pro by programs, I mean uh, specific programs to support families uh, to recover from uh, from this period. And I'm talking about the the near future. I hope. Um, um, so these and many other steps and many other measures would need to be taken up uh, by each country to ensure that the consequences of the pandemic are not irreversible, 
and uh, the, the mental health of community, it is, uh, it is saved in a way. Um, this is all from my side since uh, I have around 10 minutes. So I hope you and your families are well during this time. Best wishes. And if you have questions, I'm here to answer afterwards. Adelina, it's now. Adelina, uh, your microphone is off. Maybe you should just click. Professor Lori, maybe you can uh, unmute Adelina's microphone. I'm checking. Yeah, thank you. I'm checking. I don't. Oh, you're uh, you're under HP, uh, Adelina. You have a different name today. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where's Adelina? I, I, I have to her name. But... <laughs> okay, well, you officially unmuted. And then while I was here, I unmuted Mimosa also because she was able to join us. And Mimosa, you can just mute yourself unless you'd like to be unmuted. So uh, I will mute myself here. <laughs> okay, it's okay now? Yes, yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. As the panelists presented me, uh, I will uh, concentrate it more on my uh, work, which I do it with uh, family, uh, with uh, children with special needs. It, uh, it's something sensitive and uh, even more hard in this period of time, which based on the fact that uh, all the world has faced with COVID-19, and also, I have to repeat again that the Kosovo is a country um, just 20 years after the war and become a part of this pandemic period. It's a very, very hard for us, especially these families with uh, children, which they have children with special needs. As society, as a society, uh, people here in Kosovo suffered a lot, but. Uh, it is worth mentioning, if I can say, with great sensitivity, uh, where the children with special needs and their families. And if I add it, because in this uh, group which I work, also my colleagues also, uh, uh, except the uh, problem in their developments, they have also uh, the organic problems. Uh, this fact which need uh, rise and make more sensitivity and more harder these children because uh, this fact uh, the problem is in their development and also organic problem increase the stress and anxiety uh, in this family even more. Uh, this feeling of immediate isolation against anonymity set up us into like a war, like a feeling which manifested itself, uh, itself in uncertain way, the, po uh, the point of concern. Uh, the first, if I can say, we have a lots of things which we have to fulfill these children. Uh, but in the beginning of period of COVID-19, uh, the main concern of the parents uh, is how to provide the food. And we know uh, these children need special food. And uh, should be a little di different, and uh, this is the main things which uh, increase the level of uh, bad emotion in which I am not find the word how to describe. Uh, these children were not only attacked by difficulty of their development, but um, to this difficulty were added physical distance, quarantine, and also immediately uh, stops at once a kindergarten and school. At first, we as an um, expert, uh, we are uh, as a uh, professionalist which work with these uh, groups of our, our society. And for us, in the beginner, we have like as a emotional numbing. We, uh, we stop, see, and wait how we can help this family. But uh, after the one or two weeks, immediately we um, gather our, for, uh, our forces and with self-organization immediately we contact each other uh, we may contact with our colleagues and how to earn 
arrange and how to help this family. Uh, immediately we contact uh, how their family uh, to, to help this family in, the, in this new war. Uh, we, between each other, we agree to make uh, that, that cases that we, ha we had uh, to keep regular meeting and uh, by phone because we have just that that uh, that instrument or that uh, that object we, um, in which we can help this family. Uh, and also, we address the plan, uh, the cases which we have it, keep in touch uh, in base of videos they send us, and also at the same time, we consult also the children and the families which they have children uh, about the medication if they have it. And uh, we all did it this on individual basis. Somehow, it was a relaxation for this family uh, ending the wars, uh, of this family and especially these parents that uh, for them is, uh, if I can say, war twice, double twice uh, toward the COVID-19. But um, in this period of time, if I can say, uh, it's very hard and also the point of us uh, from our position as a, a, as a uh, professionals from mental health because the managing and also supervise this family with uh, children with special needs is very hard because the supervised uh, supervision or supported them from our family from our house is very hard and how to manage how to make the balance between us as a professionalist and also our family and even that that some of us also at the same time have uh, the member of the family which they uh, have also uh, COVID-19. And it's very hard at the same time to support someone out of the house and to support the member in a house, in our house, and also ourselves is very hard. But uh, if, you have, uh, if you have your de desire and also the energy, uh, you you will uh, find the way how to support them, but it's very uh, still they have problems. Still, I have the still. I think our uh, colleagues have the, uh, the 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 SMS and also writing by phone by mail how to manage these children. And I think uh, our society, our community has also to do and to support a lot this uh, family with this uh, children with children with special needs and uh, i hope uh, this period maybe uh, make us more awareness uh, toward this uh, this family even that uh, if you work uh, directly with this family even i uh, i will promise that you can stop to be indifferent you can stop uh, you can stop yourself to help and like as a message for our society and our government is uh, to help 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 a lot this uh, uh, this kind of family with children with special needs even that our society our community have low social economic level um, we need all uh, the support in all uh, profiles, but this part of uh, this uh, this uh, point of uh, our society is very sensitive, and I hope to help again and again toward them. Uh, this is all in short uh, point which I have described. If you have any special uh, question, you can make. Thank you. Now, Dr. Mimosa. Yes, quick. thank you, Adelina. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, yes. Sorry for all participants that you can't see my face, which is a very nice face. <laughs> <laughs> my yes. video is not working, so I'm really sorry for that. Uh, Lori, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me, Adelina, and Liria in this webinar which I see very important, not only because we are sharing our experience with you and other colleagues, but because we learn from each other too. So, of course, the situation uh, of COVID was new for us, as was for the whole globe. But 
is not been very uncommon in Kosovo uh, during uh, the March when the pandemic started, the people to connect the situation with the war situation. So it was a discussion among colleagues that they were experiencing some fears and anxiety as it's happened on the war and was the same with my client. They were showing fears, anxiety and security and a lot of feelings that uh, connected this situation with the war. And uh, it's important to state that because uh, after the war, we did a lot of work on family issues to learn about the resilience of Kosovars and how the families uh, were able to overcome all the trauma that they, they passed during the war. So in the beginning of the pandemic, I have to say that because I strongly believe that as the time is passing and the COVID in one way is changing his face, let's say that, the struggles the family have are different from the beginning. So even in the beginning, um, people were more uncertain about the illness, the course of it, how to manage COVID, the high rate of mortality. Uh, also, there were uh, the, our government uh, take measures in the beginning of March, which means that there were few cases in Kosovo when uh, they started the first phase, which was the isolation, all staying at home. So most of the people were very confused with fears, anxiety, and security, and confusion, what was going on. And also there was a high conspiracy ideas around virus and was very surprised to me that when I did the study on July, I found the 33.7% of participants still were thinking about uh, something that was more than virus. And also, as we know, the social isolation uh, and the routine change and uh, social system interrupted and there were challenging life in COVID time in the beginning. So my question was like as a therapist that I work with the family and I said, how can I maintain a dynamic and organic family system even when they are at the distance? Means that the, the families were living now in closed system and how to protect older people with a high risk of becoming infected, knowing that isolation will bring more loneliness, loss of ties with their family and community to which they belong. And we have to keep in mind that uh, the extended family is a strong uh, capacity here in Kosovo, so the, the ties that exist uh, on an extended family. And the most question that I had in the beginning was from parents asking me how to help children, not only themselves, how to handle with anxiety and with fears and with all problems going around, but how to talk with children and how much to tell them and what to do with them. And uh, also they asked about the new routines, how to set up new routines as a family and how to cope with the role change because we have uh, now we have families staying at home, two, three children going online, teaching online, parents uh, working from home. So it was kind of a challenging situation on how to structure now in this new uh, context. Uh, I have to tell that in the beginning, I was really trying to uh, work with families and to show them that that was a normal reaction on a non-normal situation. So I thought that was a good time to use and to make reconnection to each other and to know each other better. Because now we have a new situation, but we are going to live by the values that we care about each other. We face the fears and anxiety through giving support to each other, even when there is a lot of uncertainty going around. In my conversation with families online or with some cases that we did face to face and also in public presentation, I have called it the golden moment of reconnections where parents and children had the opportunity to write their own quarantine story, which helped them to give a special meaning to this new context. They have to explore now together inside family their strengths, but the weakness also. 
they have to explore what makes them special and unique, but also what makes them vulnerable. Even when they are in distance from family members, from friends, from work, school, etc. So they have to talk, share, not avoid talking about fears, anxiety, confusion, whatever experiences they were having. So because we know that resilience emerges from a heterogeneity of the members of the family, which helps them to overcome their fears. So by improving parenting skills, we have tried to create a family context which improves stress response by influencing on coping skills, not only to parents as individuals, but to the whole family. So they learn to support each other and to face together. So on that way, uh, we have tried to create a family context that interact constructively with the stress situation. So we can't avoid the stress. We can't avoid the, uh, what is happening around us, but we can interact with each other and we can face it. And this is, I think, the base of the res resilience. So we help also families to set up activities at home because a lot of questions came to me, what to do now, how we can have a new routine. So we fulfilled it with physical exercises, playing together as family, making online connection with friends, with family, using time together. Uh, so they started making new routines, but was very important as parents were complaining about having a lot of children and a lot of uh, obligation. So we, we try to make that the routine based on respect of each other and facing together on this time of coronavirus. So uh, also Lydia mentioned for parents of young children, there were uh, platforms with activities and supportive materials about how to help their children while home in order to overcome the stress. Um, this connection, I think, are very important uh, because both my, my parents living in Albania, they had uh, coronavirus and was very interesting that we make connection to uh, my parents and my brothers too, which I had six months without talking with them on the phone. But when my parents were uh, infected, we really become together. We called each other, we shared with each other, and also we used all our resources to help our parents. And my mom was saying that what was very helpful was that you keep me informed, that you talked with me and you shared with me. And this is why I overcome all the illness that I had. So I think that is very, very important that we become reconnected because most of the families, they forget when they play with their children because there are a lot of obligation around them and they have a few times for. I want to mention also that that was in the beginning and I'm talking about March, April and May, but as the virus is going on, there are other issues raised which are very important for us as professionals, as family therapists, because some family, they are losing their relatives and they have no way to grieve because it's not allowed to do the normal rituals that we usually do for our members. Also, we have infection of family members and not having community and services support because 80% of population is passing coronavirus with the mild symptoms. And as Lydia mentioned, we have a lot of uh, cases on a hospital, so there are no support for such cases. We have the burnout of health workers and no support for them. We have the death of our colleagues and no time to grieve for them. And also we have a huge number of health professionals infected too. So we have restriction of routine services to handle things. So people have to handle things inside family. For, for example, our chronic patients, there are no services for them because they are all closed down and they have to uh, work on family. So what I was doing means uh, all these things were going around me. So it was a moment when as I was trying to give myself, uh, let's say, a meaning. And I was trying to find a metaphor how to maintain the system when there were no family members there or when 
uh, they face loss, when they lost touches with them, and when when we lose our general values, let's say some rituals and beliefs that we have to hold the family together. So uh, was very interesting that came on my mind the empty chair technique. So I have used this technique very often for people that they needed to be connected to someone they lost or they needed to be connected even to someone that they didn't want to come to the session. So I said, let's make this metaphor. We have to work with families, even sometimes members are th not there. Um, so I hope people will uh, reflect on themselves now because I, to my understanding, the world is changing and not coming back as it was before COVID-19. So I do believe that all humans are resilient to some extent. Only we need to discover it and to empower it. Uh, I can support that because the study that I did with the students of psychology, and I was lucky because I did the survey on uh, February and I repeated it on May when the people were isolated. What I found was that the mental health problems were the same as before COVID-19. Even the scores of anxiety and depression were less than before uh, pandemic time. So coming back to family, because all students came back to families and being near to families, this is a protective thing. So we have to work even a pandemic with families. And we find that loneliness and isolation was a risk factor for mental health problem. So we have really to think how to help older people which are more isolated and more in uh, risk. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much. So obviously we do not have, uh, don't have uh, the time to, to give to the discussion, especially about children. I think, I mean, this is only our third panel, but it's the first time I've heard lots of focus on the needs of children in the panels. And um, this is something for us to think about, to bring, to perhaps bring forward more overtly um, as we move forward. But I want to take a moment to thank the three panelists who are uh, colleagues that I've known for a long time. And it's delightful to see you here. And I also uh, wish you well where you are as we deal with this uh, public health emergency. And I really appreciate take you taking the time to come and share your work with us today. Yes, thank you very much. It's very nice to, to meet you. And uh, we one day we have a chance to to meet face to face somewhere in the world. Yes, obviously we need a big conference for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Having it actually. We're pleased to be here, Laura. Definitely.